and uh, after practicing a very short time really approximately about one and a half years with a large hospital in Detroit okay as their um, head of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at a satellite clinic mm -hmm. I decided that I needed to learn more about the physical body and really try to answer some questions that could not be answered through my formal training well I guess what was all, what were those questions mm -hmm. well I was very concerned about the fact that of the treatments many of them that were uh, taught to me that I was supposed to render to patients appeared to create lots of pain discomfort and did not solve the original problem mm -hmm. I was uh, quite concerned about the discomfort and the pain that uh, we as physicians inflicted upon our clients and I was concerned about the fact that we were taught not to really continue to investigate any further. That is to say that there's a section of medicine that's supposed to do the research for you. Hmm. You're just supposed to do what is revealed to you to do, and if it doesn't work, it's okay. Hmm. Well, it wasn't okay for me to say that, well, this is all that we could do for you if you happen to have cancer of the uterus or cancer of the cervix, and uh, there was nothing else that could be done except to give you some morphine or a pain pill and tell the family that you would probably survive only the next three months or six months. I felt that many days, due to my own uh, tiredness or my own preoccupation with my own personal uh, life, that to tell someone else that they were not going to be around was really not appropriate. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, if you don't really have control of your own life, okay, and have control of life in general where you can create life, mm -hmm. how can you really know for a fact that someone else is not going to be here? Mm -hmm. That just didn't set well with me. And so there were just lots of questions that I felt needed to have answers for me to feel comfortable to continue to practice. Mm -hmm. So I left the conventional setting and I began to investigate some things that I had seen during my clinical years that I had no answers to. Why was it that uh, when I would recommend that my high blood pressure patients not eat pork before surgery, that we didn't have to drip in hypertensive medication? Mm -hmm. Why is it that when I recommended that my diabetics go on a diet that took out the fruit and the sugar out of their diets, that we didn't have problems with wounds not healing, etc.? Mm -hmm. So I recognized that a lot of the diseases that we could identify had dietary uh, relationships mm -hmm. and I wanted to know well why does pork have a tendency to cause high blood pressure well what is the problem with sugar mm -hmm. and wound healing and immunity mm -hmm. and then I began to come into a whole different world of recognizing the importance of minerals and vitamins recognizing that food is actually medicine and then having the opportunity to heal myself of cancer of the lung I began to then know that it's our states of consciousness mm -hmm. that really determines the quality of health, the quality of life that we are creating for ourselves moment to moment. Mm -hmm. So w working through my own personal health dilemmas and being successful in correcting them, I began to see how these could be applied to problematic uh, issues that I had seen in my clinical years. Mm -hmm. One of them was uterine fibroids. And here we have a disease that was repetitive. The fibroids constantly are growing. You cut them off, they grow. You give hormones, they grow, etc. What was the real issue here? Mm -hmm. Well, I knew that certain vitamins would repress uterine fibroids, but as soon as the ladies stopped taking the vitamin pills, they'd come back. Mm -hmm. I knew that certain herbs would repress uterine fibroids, but when they stopped taking them, they would come back. Mm -hmm. I knew that diet could control them, but when they went off on vacation for two weeks, they came back, they started having problems. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we had these diseases that appear to be unrelentless and thus we were doing something outside of ourselves to suppress the symptoms? Mm -hmm. And then that's when I started really asking questions. I began to ask women with uterine fibroids, how do they really feel about children? I mean, obviously there's a direct relationship mm -hmm. between the uterus and children. Mm -hmm. and hold, hold that for a minute, okay? Yes. We're going to come back to that. Okay. So I'm going to get Diane here okay. for a minute. Right. Okay. So, um, Daya, how did you get involved with Dr. Jewell? Okay, um, in December of well, 90... Well, first of all, first yes. of all, just tell them, just a little about bit me. about yourself. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I'm a nutrition consultant, a fasting consultant in the Holland community, and I've, we use uh, internal cleansing, utilizing herbs, colonic irrigations, and uh, spiritual practices to deal with 
health concerns. We're dealing with traditional, holistic ways of dealing with ourselves. Okay, okay so in that setting, um, some of my words were quoted in an essence article on uterine fibroids in December of 91. We got so much of a response, so many calls from all over the country that we decided to do a seminar and focus on uterine fibroids when it's looking like seven out of ten black women have them. Mm -hmm. So we're saying, wow, this is something that's going on right under our noses that no one is giving any energy to. And everywhere we turned in pulling together this seminar, Dr. Jewell's name kept coming up. Okay. Oh, if you're doing this, then you should contact Dr. Jewell because she has a program, she has a book, etc., etc. And so we invited her to come, and very graciously she accepted and came to the seminar. And we just kind of fitted her in a little spot. We gave her a little spot, and we said, okay, would you conduct this circle? <laughs> but the camera people were like, oh, oh my goodness, do you hear what the sister is saying? And, and so the feedback was so positive. Mm -hmm. The next day, Dr. Jewell had a seminar on uterine fibroids, and most of the women from the seminar went to that and introduced us to her home treatment program, which deals with body, mind, and spirit. Mm -hmm. Not just the physical manifestation of the tumor, but what thoughts are associated with us manifesting it in the mm -hmm. first place. Okay. And so the relationship was born. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, so continue. <laughs> <laughs> well. What happened was is that I realized after listening you, to Thank these you. women that they were really telling me about a value system, a belief system that obviously was in conflict with their body, okay? 99% uh, of women with uterine fibroids have had at least one or more voluntary interruptions of pregnancy. 88% mm -hmm. of women with uterine fibroids have been sexually abused. Okay, either direct incense, uh, incense, <laughs> incest, okay, mm -hmm. or have actually suffered emotional abuse, okay, in uh, what they consider the sexual areas of their body. Uh, women with uterine fibroids all have ambivalences about having children and feeling supported in having them. That is to say that there's a great question around the compatibility with a mate or the capability of a mate being able to support them and the child in that particular area of their life. Mm -hmm. So then I asked myself, well, I mean, where is the value system? Where are these belief systems coming from that make these women think this way? And I began to look at the fact that this was actually a conflict with the genetic, inherited, cultural values of an African woman. Because what they would talk about is intuitively, you know, if I have children, you know, I don't have anybody to help me raise them, you know, my grandmother's no longer here, or my mother's not interested, or whatever else, et cetera, so I'm by myself. And that created fear. Well, mm -hmm. why does it create fear? Well, inherently, the physical body has seven generations of information from the mothers inside of the family. Mm -hmm. Not only does it contain information genetically about the attributes, physical attributes of these individuals, but also their belief systems, their values, and how they lived. So intuitively, we know as African women that there is something known as the extended family. Mm -hmm. And we have come from an environment where everyone was involved in the rearing of a child, not just the mother, not just the father, et cetera. Right. Here in America, we're faced with a different dilemma because the value system here, which has been brought from Europe, by a race of people known as Caucasians. They have established a whole different perception of how they deal with family, how they deal with offspring. Mm -hmm. They have decided that the man has to have a certain criteria before he can reproduce, and the woman. They have decided that a certain amount of money has to be available before children can be born. They have decided that it is the total responsibility of the mother and the father of that child to rear a product that can then be functional in a society, but the society has no obligation at all in helping to rear that child. Now that is totally alien to the genetic value system that you've inherited, mm -hmm. because your value system, the way that your ancestors have lived, says that you get support. Mm -hmm. okay with oh. children. It says that everybody's involved. Mm -hmm. It says that money is not the issue, but the support system must be intact. That mm -hmm. is that you have a supportive husband and if that's not the case then the brother is also the support. Mm -hmm. And the uncles are the support. Mm -hmm. And the aunts and, and, and exactly everyone. Yes. everything else. But and it's and it's a guarantee in the community that there will always be male and female support. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. for that child. Doesn't necessarily have to be directly the biological parent. Mm -hmm. In African ancestry, we do not know anything about lack to the extent that there's no food, mm -hmm. okay, that there's no clothing, etc., mm -hmm. because of the type of environment that we've come from. Mm -hmm. So that has never been a criteria as to whether you have a child. Right. Okay. Even your neighbor exactly. took over. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. also understand that the understanding is is that men and women are responsible for this act. This is not just something that women do. Mm -hmm. So when you are now living in a foreign cultural value system, the decision is do you honor your value system that's inherent or do you honor the external and value system that you're exposed to? Mm -hmm. And the African woman has decided that she would honor this foreign value system. Mm -hmm. But in the process, she has created destruction of her reproductive organs. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Because nature says that you can never deny who you are and you can never deny where you've come from. Mm -hmm. And so those cultures that have been able to be successful in a foreign value system make decisions about which of the values they can honor and which ones they cannot. Mm -hmm. And so therefore this a term known as ghettos, etc., were representations of individuals who understood that they were alike because of their genetic, cultural values, and that they were willing to live that out in this particular environment, even though they understood that they would pay taxes, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. to the larger environment if that was the law, mm -hmm. that they would establish their business in such a way, etc. But when it came to their home life or their social activities, their religious involvement, etc., it was exactly like it was at home. Mm -hmm. So therefore, these people never lost their identity, even though to the extent that they did not compromise themselves, they were involved in the foreign structure that they had migrated to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The African woman has not been able to establish what I call that buffer system. Mm -hmm. That she is willing to actually honor herself as an act African woman, recognize her uniqueness and her differences, and perpetuate and maintain them, but still be able to make a contribution to the foreign environment that she's in. Mm -hmm. So she, that has to be a conscious decision. Right, she's too far removed from her culture. No, that has nothing to do with it, and that's what I teach in my uh, uterine fiber at home treatment system, mm -hmm. is the fact that there's something known as morphic resonance. Okay, and what we have discovered is that anything that has the same genetic makeup mm -hmm. is always in communication with itself anywhere in the planet. So as long as my ancestors and my sisters in Africa are being African, the energy that they transmit, just like this TV is transmitting waves to your TV, mm -hmm. I'm transmitting information to my sisters in Africa. They're transmitting information to me because I am a walking receiver and transmitter, mm -hmm. okay, radio and TV, visual and auditory. Mm -hmm. And so therefore that means that wherever I am on the planet, my genes are being stimulated to do the same thing that theirs are doing, mm -hmm. okay? So the key is that I have to consciously reject mm -hmm. doing what innately my body mm -hmm. is chemically mm -hmm. compelled mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. to take on a foreign value. Okay. And that's where the disease mechanism occurs because uterine fibroids is a chemical conflict. It is a neurotoxicity in the body. Mm -hmm. That is to say that African women being African already stimulate my genes to repeat the same behavior. Mm -hmm. But I consciously say no to that. Mm -hmm. And then I then create chemicals by accepting a foreign thought in my brain that's secreted into my bloodstream that actually causes this chemical conflict, which attacks the area that I would act out this value with in the community, which mm -hmm. would be through my uterus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it is the uterus that is identified as the organ specific mm -hmm. that is attacked with this neurotoxicity that shows a disease. Mm -hmm. And the treatment is so simple then, because mm -hmm. when the African woman is, is, is willing to actualize her dietary guidelines, mm -hmm. she's willing to actualize her value system around how she selects a mate, how she reproduces, and how that child is reared, Okay, mm -hmm. when she recognizes and accepts and begins to exhibit her own uniqueness, the uterine fibroids totally shrink on their own. Mm -hmm. I see. Do you find that in, in your, your, your research, in your work, that more um, people of African descent are having that uterine problem now as opposed to um, maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago? In well, 
because of my position, okay, and my 